tried to stop myself from looking at it. I had no control over my body. It engulfed me. It was known to me at that time that the Ministry of Defence were monitoring what was occurring in the fields in this area. A small number of these UFO sightings may well relate to extraterrestrial activity. Extraterrestrial activity, out-of-body experiences, government cover-ups, the perfect mixture for a conspiracy theory. People have been seeing UFOs um, as far back as recorded time. Look at the Middle Ages, for instance. People were seeing things in the sky that they couldn't explain then, but they didn't see them as flying saucers or spaceships. In the 14th and 15th centuries, they interpreted them as flaming swords and shields because they didn't have a spaceship frame of reference to go. When I joined the MOD and looked into the old UFO files, it became readily apparent that each year, for many, many years, there had been several hundred UFO sightings reported to the Ministry. I have no doubt, personally, based on my official research and investigation at the Ministry, that a small number of these UFO sightings may well relate to extraterrestrial activity. And I don't say that lightly, I say it on the basis of there being craft in our airspace capable of speeds and manoeuvres way beyond anything that we've got in our inventory. Nick Pope believes an incident that happened 20 years ago may well be the closest Britain has got to an alien encounter. The event is known as the Rendlesham Forest Incident. Although the pictures are reconstructed, the voices are real. In the early hours of Boxing Day 1980, a strange light was seen over Rendlesham Forest in Suffolk. Staff at nearby NATO airbase RAF Bentwaters tracked the UFO as it crashed into the trees. A patrol of American servicemen was sent to investigate. The guard patrol encountered a landed metallic craft. There were indentations on the forest floor. They ran a Geiger counter around these indentations. They found the levels of radiation were ten times what they should have been for the area concerned. Only the military knew about the incident. The public knew nothing until 1983 when a former airbase security guard who'd been on that eventful patrol, spoke to BBC News. This thing came down, the red light over it, and sat there maybe two seconds. It was just a ball of light in the air, maybe 20 feet off the ground, 30 feet, and it dispersed in a multitude of colors. And they all seemed to fall on top of this thing. And before our eyes, it's almost indescribable, but there was a, a craft, an alien spacecraft. Some people saw lights in the sky, some people saw something very much more involved than that, uh, a landed craft. Now, I have no doubt that this is an absolutely extraordinary case. However, the Ministry of Defence takes a different line. It states the incident posed no significant threat and was therefore not worth investigating. But this still doesn't tell us what actually happened. Theories range from NATO manoeuvres to Martian intruders. UFO researcher Jenny Randalls has spent 20 years investigating the case. She believes she has uncovered the truth about that night. The Rendlesham Forest case is undoubtedly the most complex UFO investigation that I've ever been involved in. It's the most notorious and talked about incident in Britain. After World War II, a lot of covert radar-based experiments were set up here. During the 1970s, we know that there was some sort of a, an attempted experiment to perfect a super powerful radar system which sends very powerful beams of energy right out into space and bounces them back off the ionosphere. Um, unfortunately, what was discovered as a side effect of that kind of research was that um, these beams caused odd things to happen in the atmosphere. They caused the atmosphere to glow because they created plasma effects in and around them. They created all kinds of severe physiological effects on people who got too close to them. Weird. The odds are pretty high that one of these experiments was underway at the time when this particular incident occurred and these people just happened to get trapped within the energy field. I suspect a degree of cover-up was, was mounted to try and obscure the um, uncomfortable consequences of admitting the kind of research that was going on there. 
But Nick Pope is adamant this incident was not a military experiment, but one that had all the hallmarks of a UFO. Some two weeks after the incident, a report was made by the United States Air Force to the British Ministry of Defence um, describing this in terms of a UFO incident. Uh, the government and the military are not in the business of telling lies to people. So the book on Britain's closest encounter of the third kind remains well and truly closed. Conspiracy theorists believe not only does the government know about aliens, it works alongside them at this military complex. Better known as Area 51, the base covers 4,000 square miles and is patrolled by armed guards with a license to kill. Public access is strictly forbidden. Area 51 was started in 1955. It was a joint venture between the CIA and Lockheed Martin Skunk Works. At first to develop the U-2 spy plane. From there they went on to develop the SR-71 Blackbird and what they needed was a secure location out in the middle of the wilderness, which uh, Area 51 was ideal. It's out in the middle of the desert with hardly nothing around it. Donald Emery spends much of his time monitoring what goes on around the base, but admits it's difficult finding out what really happens inside. It actually took them 40 years to actually claim that there was a site out there. Uh, it was 1995 when they actually said that there's an operating facility near Groom Lake. And of course that's, for now, that's the only thing they've ever said. Although the Area 51 base is not named on any map, it does show up on this Russian satellite photograph. Because of all the secrecy, um, people come up with all kinds of ideas of what they're doing out there, simply because we don't know. Some people speculate that there's actually some kind of trading agreement going on where the aliens actually traded saucers or technologies to the Americans. In 1996, a man spoke to the BBC who claims to have worked inside Area 51. Better still, he claims to have been inside an alien craft. The emotions, the feeling that I felt inside uh, when I first entered the craft are quite different from what you'd expect. It's a very ominous feeling, um, a feeling as if you, you shouldn't be there. I, I know that sounds kind of corny, but that, that, that is truly, truly how I felt. Electronics engineer Bob Lazar told the BBC he joined a highly secretive team whose job it was to duplicate and remake the engines of alien craft stored at Area 51. The propulsion system is quite exotic. It's a gravity propulsion system. There's no propeller, there's no jet exhaust, there's no, no obvious mode of propulsion. The first time I saw the disc fly, it lifted virtually silently off the ground. We're looking at something about 52 feet in diameter, just hovering silently in the air. It drifted over to the left, to the right, and then set back down. Pretty uneventful test, but it was uh, quite impressive. Lazar claimed that he worked not only Area 51, he said he was transferred to another location south of Area 51 called S4. And he said inside the mountain there, which is totally concealed, that's actually where they back engineer alien spacecraft. Um, supposedly there's alien bodies there. Now, I, I'm not, again, going to discredit that claim because I can't prove that it's not true. But to, to what we've come up with, our research done, it merely looks like an advanced aircraft design and energy weapon test facility uh, no aliens, UFOs. They will make up reports to misbelieve, misdirect people in other thinking. Um, there's definitely a conspiracy there because if it's just advanced aircraft, they have to lie about it. So at least that our enemies won't know about it. There'll actually be people out there hunting for aliens when they may actually just be looking at advanced aircraft. Oliver's Castle, Wiltshire, 1989. There's a couple of lights down there somewhere. This controversial film 
appears to show strange objects hovering above a cornfield. Below, complex circle formations appear. Retired electrical engineer Colin Andrews is now a self-styled crop circle investigator. He believes they can't be explained away as a force of nature. There are features which we can't easily account for. Uh, plants that are changed at the cellular anatomic level, bent where they shouldn't be bent, plants that are subtle when they shouldn't be, uh, plants that bend and should break but do not. So, is this the footprint of extraterrestrial life? They signify something. There's information encoded in them. And the circle in itself is a very, is a universal symbol, very important symbol, signifies everything. So have intelligent life forms traveled millions of miles to trample on corn? There is, of course, another explanation. We always work in pretty much in the dead of night. And we enter into the field very, very carefully and very, very stealthily. We use the tractor lines to walk up to the field. We don't step across virgin crop. We don't leave trails. Using nothing more than a measuring tape and a plank of wood or stalk stomper, the hoaxers set about their work. We work very tightly to um, diagrams which are obviously uh, worked up beforehand and something called a construction sequence, which is kind of key to making sure that everybody's in the right place at the right time. There's definitely a symbiotic relationship between ourselves as the suppliers of the phenomena and those that, that, that have a demand, that need the phenomena. Um, sometimes their need is a very casual one as a visitor or tourist to this region. Um, and on, in other cases, their need is a very, um, a very intense one and it's one that revolves around beliefs and conspiracies about where, they, where the circles originate from. But in either case, we, we you know, fulfill that need really you know, in, in our own way. In summer 2000, there were over 120 reported circles in southern England, most put down to hoaxes. I think what we're looking at is, is approximately 80% or so of the patterns uh, that are appearing around the English countryside uh, are man-made. I don't think there's any question that 10-15% uh, or so is a real phenomenon. But, as the conspiracy theorist would have us believe, not only are aliens leaving evidence in our crops, they're also leaving their mark on our animals. Since the 1960s, specifically in America, farmers and people living in rural areas have begun to find uh, animals that have been killed, They've had uh, parts of the body, ears, uh, rectums, vaginas, other, other soft tissue parts that have been carefully and surgically removed. In every state in the United States, in every province in Canada, just if you took North America over 40-some years, you're in thousands. Intrigued by the mystery, investigative reporter Linda Moulton Howe has spent the past 20 years trying to find out who is responsible for these disturbing animal deaths. I have talked with ranchers where they've had mutilations. They know what predation is. They know what disease is. And in some cases, they've had satanic cults take animals and plunge knives into them. This, this is not like this. These are all so neat and so pristine and so perfect, and that's what spooks people. For more than five years, Utah rancher Eli Warnick has had 14 cattle from his herd mutilated. He firmly believes there's a paranormal explanation. It's just a completely different deal, and people that think it's predators, is not, they're just not living in the real world. They haven't seen enough to know what they're talking about. I think these cattle are, are immobilized, they're picked up, removed from our property. Uh, this operation is done somewhere else, and I think these cattle are brought back and left on site. In many cases, farmers report seeing mysterious beams of light flying around mutilation sites. Evidence of extraterrestrials, according to this eyewitness in Texas. I saw this big black cow laying down with its mouth, and I said, my God, they got a cow. But what are they doing to it? Within one month of the very first phone calls, conversations with sheriffs, 
with uh, ranchers, fellow journalists who had been in the story. What I was hearing was, I won't talk to you in front of the camera, but this is what I know. They confirm, at least from their first-hand knowledge point of view, that the government of the United States has known since the mid-1950s that what they call extraterrestrial biological entities are interacting with our planet and that the unusual deaths are the target of this non-human intelligence. And so a scenario common to all conspiracy theories pops up. People claim that the governments, the American government in particular, turn a blind eye to what's going on out in the prairies. This is possibly the conspiracy th theory taken to its highest degree because there's no evidence whatsoever at all for this. Yet again, it allows people to, to look at the authority figure, the government, and to say, you know what's going on, but you won't tell us. Diane and Peter Shepard's story is similar to hundreds of reported alien encounters around the world. On a summer's night in 1975, they were driving down a country road near Northampton. A red ball of light appeared in the sky above them. Diane claims to have gone into instant paralysis and remembers little of the encounter. Peter claims the lights appeared to communicate directly to him for more than 40 minutes. This was a bit, it was an object, but I mean, he was alive. It was, he was alive. This was a being, even though to me it was, appeared to be a ball of light. Or at first it was. But then, when it engulfed me, it knew everything about me. Everything about me. There were no secrets. It knew everything about everything. I respect the views of people who argue that they've seen evidence that persuades them that um, UFOs exist, and I agree with them. UFOs, in the strict definition of the term, do exist. Where I disagree with them is interpreting that evidence as proof that there are aliens in spaceships flying here. Unfortunately, the reality of UFO investigation is that you discover that an experience that a witness has depends upon so many different things. There is an initial stimulus. They've certainly seen something which has caused them to have some kind of sighting. But that is then filtered through human perception, human expectation. There's no doubt that Diane and Peter passionately believe they had a UFO experience. They're equally adamant the government investigated their case. We're just an ordinary couple. Um, we're just an ordinary couple. We're not paranoid or anything. We've had gentlemen from the intelligence services contact us. Of course, we don't tell them nothing. We never have. Because they already know. We've kept everything confident about other people. They already people. know. There was an arm of the establishment which knows. When we asked the Ministry of Defence about this case, they said that no official had ever contacted Peter and Diane Shepard. Is it any wonder with such conflicting accounts, conspiracy theories thrive? One thing that I am very sure about um, is the issue of, of whether there is any cover-up uh, with regard to the UFO issue. And I can say, as somebody who has now been a civil servant in the Ministry of Defence for 15 years, three years of which were actually spent on the UFO desk handling this data day by day, there is no cover-up, there is no conspiracy. So, in the absence of concrete evidence of genuine UFO encounters or government cover-ups, what is the truth about the UFO conspiracy? I think the, the modern belief in ufology has arisen because we live in um, a post-industrial age, we live in a post-religious age, we live in a post-nuclear age, and people are desperate for something to believe in, some form of uh, divine intervention, if you like, something other than what's going on on Earth. And the subject of UFOs, extraterrestrials, life on other planets, and so on, gives people that hope. It gives them the hope that there is something out there that is bigger and more than we have here on Earth. It's worth noting that for more than 40 years, scientists have been beaming messages out into the galaxy in the hope of attracting an intelligent answer. As yet, no one has picked up the phone. <laughs>